I should have sat down and been a, an a economic professor and figured all that out years ago when I was young. But I don't think many women do. I mean, you just live from paycheck to paycheck. Within Illinois, three quarters of the elderly poor are women. Most of the people who come to us are elderly people on Social Security. Many of them can hardly make it from one check to another. If they're not poor enough, they can't qualify for Medicaid. Those kind of people are in a particularly vulnerable situation. We can't hardly make it sometimes, but ain't nothing we can do about it, seem like, because it's in the government's hand. Tonight on WTTW Journal, we examine the harsh realities a woman may face when she gets old. Hello, I'm Lindsay Wagner. The women you're about to meet were once young and vibrant and ageless. Now in their later years, they're facing hardships that were unimaginable in their youth. Their stories challenge us to take a hard look at an issue that most of us, particularly women, would rather avoid. In many ways, aging is a woman's issue. Women are more likely to live longer, live alone, and live in poverty. In the state of Illinois, 15% of all elderly women live below the poverty line. And as women get older, their risk of poverty increases. Today's older women had very few opportunities to gain financial independence. They were discouraged from working outside the home, and when they did, they earned less and they received fewer benefits, if any. Not many women could have anticipated that living a traditional life would have a profound and potentially devastating effect on their older years. Women who are elderly today faced the beginning of their adult lives in the post-war years, when a victorious nation swelled with optimism and the promise of enduring prosperity. Rosie the Riveter was no longer needed, and women were asked to lay down their tool belts and their briefcases to return to more conventional roles. Once again, it was expected that a woman would marry, raise a family, and put her trust in the male breadwinner. See, the guys were all coming home from the service, you know? And uh, every weekend, they'd all meet at the wishing post, a hangout. And uh, they'd get a little too much to drink and take somebody up to Iowa City, Iowa, and as fast as you go to the preacher and license and the hospital there does the blood testing. As fast as you can do all that, you're married, you know? Most women of Norma's generation married young and were encouraged to leave their careers behind. Norma was no different. She eloped to Iowa City and upon her return was expelled from nurses training. Married women were not allowed. Well, I was married twice. I was married in 48 and divorced, no children. And I waited till 53 to get married again. And I married a widower with two children, two boys. That's the one that skipped out. <laughs> he didn't want a playhouse no more. Norma was left to support herself and her son. Without nurses training, she worked as a nurse's aide and later as an in-home health worker. Low paying service jobs, principally held by women. So I think people are just really beginning to realize that what happens to you as a woman as you are uh, growing up and going through your younger and midlife years has a real impact on how you are um, able to handle your financial arrangements and whether you're living in poverty or not after you uh, reach your older years. When you're working the kind of work I'm working and juggling the books like that, one month I'm working the next month the patient died or went in a nursing home or whatever, you know? And you got no income coming in, so... Norma worked without benefits or job security. One day last summer, without money to pay the rent, Norma was evicted. So as every day goes by, you just know you're not going to make that rent. So I thought, sure, I'm not afraid to tell a landlord that. I'd rather be up front than keep, avoid answering the door or the phone. I mean, I'm not going to live like that for nobody, you know? And, uh, but what happens to me when I get thrown out of here? That's the depressing part. Today, Norma lives in subsidized housing. Without it, her monthly income of $365 would leave her without even a decent place to live.
the demand for affordable housing far exceeds the supply. For the elderly living alone, who are predominantly women, nearly half of their income is spent on housing. I should have sat down and been an economic professor and figured all that out years ago when I was young. But I don't think many women do. I mean, you just live from paycheck to paycheck. Keep getting another job if you need more, and uh, just, just the way it goes. Probably the, the most important thing, I think, in our society is some kind of, of subsidized housing or senior housing or for all ages. It seems to me the, the most economical way to help people live dignified lives and be the least, least cost to society, actually, and yet we've done a fine job of reducing the number of those homes available. At the time when, when you, you know, seem like everything going your way, you really don't think too much. You know, because I didn't have no problem, no health problem. I was working, and after he passed away, I lived. You know, I know that I had my life had to keep going. Miss Adams was a domestic worker. She never dreamed her health would one day prevent her from working. Like one in three older minority women, Miss Adams' income is below the poverty line. I knew I had diabetes, and then uh, my leg went to swelling and giving me a lot of problem. You know, in my feet. I went into the hospital. And he told me, he said, George, you're going to have to come in, so we're going to have to operate on this leg right away. I didn't do it. You know, I waited about two weeks. And then one morning I got up, I looked at my toenail, and it was dark green looking, you know, blue looking. I said, oh, God, I better get out of here. So I went on over there. After Miss Adams' stay in the hospital, she became a client of the Five Hospital Homebound Elderly Program. Hi, Miss Adams, it's Cara. I'm on my way, OK? All right, bye-bye. Cara Passione is her caseworker. Miss Adams is, is pretty low income. She gets the minimum Social Security. Um, therefore, she's eligible for um, some food stamps. She isn't always eligible for a Medicaid card. She's on what's called a spend down, which means that she will get it some months depending on how, much, um, how many medical bills she's paid. So on the, in the months that she is eligible for Medicaid, then that helps pay for her medications. Miss Adams spends a large portion of her income on health care and medications, as do many older women who suffer from multiple chronic illness. Okay, it's Cara. Hello. Hi, Miss Adams. How you doing? Okay, how are you? Okay. How have you been? I have fine. Just had a birthday. Yes. Yeah. The fastest growing segment of the elderly population is the frail elderly, a group which also tends to be the poorest. Do you have any bills that you need for me yes. to look at? Where, where are they at? Let's take a look at them. See the wild green bills? Man, I had so many letters. So I might have five and six letters a day in my mailbox from Grand Hospital. Oh, child. Carla hold me out a whole lot. She said, Miss Adam, don't worry. I'd be so nervous because I don't like bills and can't pay them. And I didn't have the money to pay. And they know I didn't have the money to pay them. But see, they just bill me anyway. And some of them turned me over to the collector man, you know, and I had to pay that. So I was in a mess here, child, for a couple of years back. Because her Social Security income is so low, Ms. Adams qualifies for some state and federal aid, but is not poor enough to receive aid consistently. Cara and Ms. Adams play a shell game with health care, waiting to schedule doctor's appointments for when there may be a Medicaid card. Cara spends a huge portion of her time with Ms. Adams trying to make sense of the public aid system and wading through Ms. Adams' medical bills. So you want to apply these toward your spend down, right? You should have enough now, right? Yeah. I have um, generally, when the, if they have Medicare and they're pretty low income, they can't afford a supplemental insurance to cover the other 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. And if they're not poor enough, they can't qualify for Medicaid to cover those. Those kind of people are in a particularly vulnerable situation. A lot of older women are just, just have a really low income. They're just living on minimal Social Security or SSI. Um, not too many get a pension to help supplement that. So they're forced to, to try and survive and pay their bills out of what little Social Security they get. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens. This is the man that instigated the Social Security in the first place. 
I mean, the man had a lot of vision as to helping older people, but the only thing wrong with it is that somewhere along the way, the job that he had wanted done isn't really doing the job. It's not taking care of us as we get older. We are barely surviving on it, and I don't think that's what he planned on. The original purpose of Social Security when the system was founded in 1935 was to replace, in part, income that's lost by a worker at retirement. It was not the original intent or the original purpose of Social Security to be the sole support for a worker at retirement. And yet for Betty and more than one third of all elderly unmarried women, there was no choice. Social Security provides at least 90% of their income. So I guess I was like all the rest of them. I just took it for granted that my government was going to take care of me and had to wait until I got old enough to start drawing it to realize it wasn't doing the job. The formula for calculating Social Security benefits is the same for men and women, but women typically receive less. The formula does not take into account the raising of a family or taking care of others, roles traditionally held by women. So by virtue of the fact that they enter the workforce later in life, many of them drop out of the workforce to care for children, and now we're seeing many drop out of the workforce to care for aged parents. They wind up with a number of zero years in their computation. So uh, in the case of women, the benefit is generally less because they've worked fewer years and have earned less money. Women may also have to live on less when they're widowed. For a couple living on Social Security, their income is based on combined payments to a retired worker and his wife. As a widow, her personal benefits will increase. However, because she loses the benefit paid to her husband, her monthly income will only be 67% of what they were living on as a couple. The Social Security benefit formula for survivors dramatically affects women, since half of all women over 65 are widows. Two people can live uh, really cheaper than one. So when the one dies, the one just has the one income coming in. And in this country, we still have most older women living on nothing but Social Security, which is hard for people to believe. You can understand where their lifestyle is going to be. Pensions are the leading supplement to Social Security, yet only 23% of women over 65 receive any sort of pension income. As homemakers uh, during the 30s, 40s, 50s, they were not earning a pension. They were dependent upon their husband's pensions. Uh, the laws were such that if uh, their husband indeed had a pension, uh, their husband necessarily would not assign them as beneficiary. It might have been on purpose, uh, or it might have been because the husband may have wanted to take more money during his lifetime. And so you have women who are left with nothing when their husbands die. I never worked at any, anything that that I could draw pension on, you know, like a place that long. Miss Burgess is blind and suffers from many physical problems, including diabetes, and she qualifies for several government assistance programs. However, benefits from these programs can work in conflict. Last December, she received a small increase in her Social Security payment, but when she didn't receive her food stamps for the month, she called her caseworker. I called her twice and asked her, uh, asked her I said, Miss Amir, uh, you, uh, I didn't get my stamps this month. She said, well, you're not eligible for them because you got a, a raise on your Social Security. The increase in Miss Burgess's payment had changed her eligibility for public aid. While Social Security was putting $16 in one pocket, public aid took $92 in food stamps out of the other. Mm -hmm. Because of her raise, Miss Burgess's income actually dropped $82. So it's just kind of hard on you sometimes when you especially don't have much and look like what little bit you have sometimes, they take that away from me because the stamp did help me out pretty good. You know, buying my food, by me being a diabetic, I had to have a certain kind of food you can't eat in and everything. And uh, buy all your medication, like my insulin, my heart medicine, my, I have got to, got to get medicine for that so it's just really tough you can't hardly make it sometimes but 
Ain't nothing we can do about it, seem like, because it's in the government's hand. As America ages, government spending for senior support services has not kept pace with the rapid growth of the elderly population. There you go, so tired. We've uh, received a certain amount of dollars from the federal government, and over the last 12 years, those dollars have basically been stagnant. There had been no movement in funding of senior service programs at the federal level, anywhere near the cost of living increases and then the phenomenal growth of our senior population nationwide. So we haven't really grasped the national implications of aging outside of the Social Security program, Medicare programs, which, you know, balloon in terms of their cost. Illinois has met many more of the needs than almost any other state in the union. But here, this recession is reaching Illinois, and we're seeing that there's, there still hasn't been a, completely, a complete institutionalization of that support. For the poorest of the poor elderly, additional government aid is available. Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, is a federal needs-based program to help the blind, disabled, and aged who have limited means. In 1991, three quarters of those receiving SSI on the basis of age were women. One would expect that public assistance for the old, supplemental security income, would solve the problem of poverty for the old, but in fact it doesn't, and it doesn't for two reasons. Number one, even if you get SSI, it doesn't bring you above the poverty line. SSI gives you an income below the poverty line. Second, many elderly people who are eligible for SSI simply do not apply for SSI. There are a variety of reasons for this. Some is that they just don't want to ask for help. They're afraid they'll be stigmatized. Another reason is that some people just don't know about it. But for whatever reason, there are poor elderly persons who are eligible for SSI and not getting it. And even those who are getting it are not getting enough to get out of poverty. The real object of the game from day one was you're going to be a married lady and you're going to be a mother and you're going to raise children. I mean we graduated from high school in 47 and it was just after the war was over and so everything was hyped as uh, the boys are back and the world is wonderful and uh, uh, we'll go off into the sunset. For young women of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, planning a secure future meant finding the right man and settling down. In 1954, Connie thought her journey into the sunset had begun. She met and married Bob, they had three children, and like many middle-class women, she believed her future was assured. We uh, had problems with communication between him and myself, and uh, unfortunately, alcohol entered the picture, and of course, uh, my Catholic upbringing said this marriage is going to work no matter what, so I hung in there for a total of 25 years. But uh, in trying to divorce him, uh, it got pretty awful. Without a husband to rely on, Connie suddenly had to support herself and soon realized she had few skills that would provide the security she once had. I was 50 at the time that I was divorced. And uh, it was like, all right, now uh, go out and get a job and support yourself. And uh, I had no qualifications. I was trained to be a wife, to be a mother, and to be a entertainment committee of one. You are making and enhancing your husband's job. And you're there for the downs as well as the ups. And your reward is no retirement. In 1986, Connie remarried. Happily settled, she believed that with Neil, her emotional and financial security was restored. Without warning, Connie would again find herself alone. We were out for dinner with my son-in-law, and we came home, and Neil died in my arms uh, from a heart attack that uh, was two weeks before we would have been married two years. And so I was back to being alone again and trying to start my life all over again. 
if you should ever be in a divorce situation or your husband should die, you're in a terrible situation. First of all, you're dealing with a tragedy and you have to have the emotional wherewithal to get through that. On top of that, you're adding this financial burden that you never wanted in the first place. Ann Diamond is a financial planner. She travels the country with a simple message for women, take control. What it means for women, because we live longer, is we need to accumulate a larger sum of money. And so if that means that we're not going to get it from Social Security and we're not going to get it from our employers, then we're going to have to do it ourselves. If you can't depend on anybody else, and even if you have a wonderful marriage and a wonderful relationship with a husband, a woman has to have a career or expertise or training and also have some fiscal responsibility herself. The women of my generation and those before me really grew up thinking this wasn't our job. This was someone else's job, you see. We uh, grew up in families where the boys knew and were aware that they were supposed to do this, but we really never got that message. The cultural stereotype of men are better at math and women English is still widespread. Women must break away from this trap and prepare financially for how they wish to live in their later years. A retirement plan begins with information, which only requires a small investment in time. What we suggest that people do is that well in advance of retirement that they actually get a benefit estimate, which we can provide. As a matter of fact, we now have the capability to provide estimates to young people. There's nothing sadder than getting a person who is thinking about retiring, who's coming in for private counseling, and, say, and, and saying, I wish I had done this, or if only I had known to participate in my plan. Why didn't somebody tell me that? I'm telling them now. And so they have a choice now. For seniors who need additional income, agencies such as the National Center and Caucus on Black Aged can help with employment training and support services. The National Center primarily helps minority elderly who often require greater assistance because of past discriminations which limited their opportunities. Approximately 75% of the clients on our program are women. Some can't write, some cannot read. Uh, so we have to assist, we have to explain, which we do ordinarily anyway. But we take the time to make sure that they understand what it is they're signing, the purpose of the documents, in order to determine their eligibility status, and also to assist us in finding out what kind of supportive services we need to provide. Programs such as the Salvation Army's Frontline Feeding Program attempt to make a small dent in the wall of poverty. Neighborhood centers and religious organizations are convenient, usually offer aid quickly without strict requirements, and can provide a strong sense of community. I was having kind of a little bit of problems where it wasn't the end of the month, believe it or not, it was the beginning of the month. I mean, I would get my check, and it was like a week later I was broke. To get through the month, Betty goes to a nearby mission for help. Well, Sister Phil, she gives food differently than most places do. Most places only give food once a month. She gives food every week. So I, I'm kind of getting both things that I needed, the food and the spiritual guidance. Most of the people who come to us are elderly people on Social Security. Uh, many of them um, can hardly make it from one check to another. Without the services that we provide here at Chicago Missionary Society, uh, they would be hungry, very hungry, before the month is over. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. The best thing is to be able to take care of yourself, it is to have the income and be able to choose the services and be able to decide where you're going to live and how you're going to live. But those options are narrowed constantly and you, and you get to a point where you, if you're frail and you have functional limitations, you're probably going to need some kind of help. Then to be a king of a vast domain. I thought that I would live like I had lived before. Only I found that doesn't happen. I don't live like I used to. The money doesn't go as far. You're almost afraid to heat your house for fear that you're going to have to take your whole check just to pay for your gas bill and your light bill. I would like to hear from Betty. 
Now, she has a song that's, it, it's so beautiful. It, it shows her determination. Even though Should we is, uh, have more children sort of in Head Start? Should we raise teachers' salaries? Or should we try to eliminate the problem of poverty for old people? How can we choose among the vast array of alternatives? And I think that in this era, in this country, that we should be able to accomplish all of those objectives and that we shouldn't have to choose between them. I'm very glad to be here. I haven't been here for a while. I had been in the hospital. And I'm very happy to see all of you people here again. When I first found Jesus, something or me so like lightning. I get sick. I get to hurting. I sound like a broken record. Oh, my leg hurts. Oh, this hurts. Who wants to listen to that? Nobody. So you suffer it and you just try to get along the best you can. And there's so many just like me. So many of them out there. And I feel for them because I know what they're going through. I am determined to hold out to the end. I don't think, though, most people realize how grim the future is because there's all sorts of data and statistics that say that we're going to have more poverty among older women in the, in the next, you know, when, by the year 2000 than we do today. It's going to be the one part of our population that's going to become more poverty stricken. That's why we have to find some other kind of social system in this country. Increasing numbers of older women are becoming dependent on social programs for their sole support. As they grow older, their chances of beating poverty diminish. The only escape for younger women is economic independence, which is still hindered by inequalities in social policies and in the workplace. And this is what I have to look forward to. And uh, sometimes it makes you wonder, you know, is it worth it all? Your, your job is done. What's left for you? I've got pictures. And memories, that's it. Everything else is gone. And he will lose the track, but I'm so full of glory. My Lord, I always find, and I just say to Satan, oh man, get thee behind. I am determined to hold out to the end. Jesus is with me, on him I can depend. For I know I have salvation, for I feel it in my soul. I am determined to hold out to the end. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord.